Division of Water Resources since 1984. In 2007, David was appointed Chief Engineer. In this capacity, David directs the staff uh, in fulfilling the broad responsibilities of the state's water resources, including administration of four interstate water compacts, more than 30,000 active water rights, and the safety of thousands of dams and other water structures. Thank you. The Kansas water, at the uh, Governor's Water Conference. Uh, you guys can find something else to do if you want because uh, uh, this. Uh, so, how many of you went to the breakfast with Barfield talk? Okay, I guess it's just you all. So, you early birds. Uh, uh, this talk is sort of a subset of what I uh, provided at the at the, the Governor's Water Conference. They decided to call it Breakfast with Barfield this year. I just didn't pick that title, so so I, I had to come up with a new title for this, and, and I probably should have said toward resolving two long-term water challenges uh, over all the declines in the Quivira, because we don't have either of these resolved yet. So um, one of the things I'm finding, I've been with the division for 35 years and sort of been involved in our interstate stuff and, uh, and, and sort of broader issues for 27 of those 35. And these, these large problems, just they just take decades to, to grind through. But we're making progress in both of those, and I want, just want to sort of give you an update on sort of the latest. Um, I sort of come here every two or three years and keep talking about the same thing. So here we go again. Uh, so just to provide a little bit of background, um, the Division of Water Resources, as, as was indicated in the introduction, um, we, we have responsibility near 30 different statutes, but our principal duties are sort of running, sort of the, administering the Kansas Water Appropriation Act and our system of, of, of water rights, and then also uh, dam safety and floodplain regulation making sure we get our share of interstate um, water supplies. So so we're going to talk about the Kansas Appropriation Act. Most of you are familiar with this as well. It dedicates uh, all the water of the states uh, to the citizens, but sets up a system by which uh, that water can be appropriated for private and public purposes. Um, first in time, first in right is, is how we, we manage it when we don't have enough water. And this will come into play in the Quivira discussion. We manage groundwater, surface water, and the single law and priority system, unlike many of our, our neighbor states. So, so the, the division is charged with allocating the water and then administering it when, when there's not enough for everyone. So again, we're going to focus. Um, sorry, uh, we're going to focus part of the talk in the Ogallala, which is sort of part of the Ogallala High Plains system. Um, and it's where most of our declines in, in western Kansas are occurring. Uh, we're going to also, um, and so as we talk about the, uh, that problem and, and sort of what's been going on, especially in the last uh, 10 years, uh, a lot of the focus is going to be there. And then that'll be the sort of first half of my presentation. Then we'll move to south central Kansas to the related high plains uh, system. Uh, as we move to the east, we, we have uh, more precipitation less imbalance, less declines, but we're still seeing some very profound effects of groundwater pumping on the surface system uh, in that area. So we'll talk about what problems that creates. So so first we'll start then, the first half is on the Ogallala Challenge. So this, this challenge has been around a long time. This map depicts essentially the percentage change in saturated thickness from pre-development to current. Uh, you know, brown is bad, so we have a lot of brown. Uh, although this is still an important part of the economy for the for the for this region, and still uh, desire to, to 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 use it for economic benefits today, but you know, can we also find ways to to uh, to keep that benefit occurring in the decades to come? And that's 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 the challenge we're dealing with here. So um, so I want to talk about the additional tools, especially we've been granted again over the last eight years to address uh, address these, this problem. So. So again, the legislature recognized we had problems out in western Kansas uh, as early as 1972 when they passed what's called the Groundwater Management District Act that allowed for the creation of these uh, sort of local units of government to sort of assist us in, in, in developing, um, uh, you know, rules and, and uh, programs and, and other ways to, to, uh, to deal with the, the declines. 1978, uh, the, the legislature recognizing that 
Uh, there are areas that are highly overappropriated, in decline. We needed a tool to sort of see if maybe there's a way to, to provide additional management in defined areas to address those those declines. Particularly, I think having in mind maybe setting allocations to sort of reduce use. And as we'll, we'll talk about here in a minute, uh, not much happened with that. So in, in 2012, we got a new new tool called Lemus that we'll talk about, and then 2015 WCAs, and then again. Uh, trying to find ways to, there's sort of a use it or lose it mentality out there. Your water rights, an annual allocation, so I need to use it for my economic advantage, otherwise I lose the benefit of that. That really is, is, is only true in a short-term sense, and, and especially in the Ogallala where we're in decline, you use it today, it's no longer uh, up, up, up there available in, in the long-term future. So uh, how do we get rid of this mentality and, and really some of the, the structural things in our law that, that encourage that? really misuse of the resource. So, all right, so let's go through each of these. So intensive groundwater use control areas, or IGUCAs, uh, is one way to deal with these declines. Again, passed in the 78 Act, it basically allowed uh, for either a GMD or the chief engineer to find an area with a problem. And then we have basically a hearing process uh, because you're, you're adjusting people's property rights, water rights are property rights. And through that hearing process, you decide how do you address the problem with, with what the statute calls corrective controls. Um, now, the, the challenge with this is that, um, at least I think that one of the reasons it has not been used more extensively in the Ogallala is the chief engineer essentially decides what to do about the problem based on the record. So uh, groundwater management districts in particular that have problems in the, in the, in the decline, uh, um, they can initiate a hearing process, but they can't determine what that hearing process produced. And so uh, we have eight IGUCAs, as we call them. And, and the one thing you'll, I only, the only thing I want you to note in this slide is none of them are really in the Ogallala Aquifer itself. Um, they're all in basically, uh, for the most part, alluvial corridors or some, some, um, some areas out here in, in central Kansas. And, and again, that's because I think they were, they're, they're just afraid to start the process when they don't know what the result will be. So. Fast forward from 1978 to about 2010, uh, Northwest Kansas, and again, let me back up. So um, we're going to talk about Lemus next, and both Lemus, oops, that's not good. I think I turned off the right. um, Both Lemus are in this uh, Northwest Kansas area here we're going to talk about. So, so their manager, Wayne Bossard, back in that time frame, they identified six high priority areas that are sort of irregular. Um, shapes on this. They're the areas where there's sort of the highest concentration of use, the greatest declines. Uh, they wanted to sort of focus their regulation in those particular areas. And so uh, we had a groundwater model that uh, was, was developed for them and uh, some, some modeling results. And he went out to those areas and said, this is where your future is. Do you want to try something different? And of the six areas, one of them, Sheridan County, Sheridan number six, high priority number six, uh, wanted to do something. They wanted to reduce their use 20% to extend the life of the aquifer their area. Uh, we, we, um, we sort of looked at a couple of different ways of doing it, including using the, the IGUCA tools, but because of the problem I, I referenced earlier, uh, they just weren't comfortable, um, despite my attempts to get them comfortable. And so, uh, so that was kind of a disappointing thing, but the good thing was uh, we sort of outlined a new approach, went to the legislature, and got the ability to do LEMAs instead. And, uh, we'll, we'll, um, and, and basically, as soon as the statute was passed, they, they moved forward with that uh, proposal to, to reduce pumping 20% in this, this Lima, and uh, it was adopted, and it's, it's working well. But again, it's a very limited area. So, so again, Limas are like IGUCAs, a defined problem, corrective controls to address the problem, public hearings to provide due process. The difference is the, the, the GMD proposes a specific plan to address the problem, a specific set of corrective controls, and the hearing basically is, should this, is this necessary? Do we have a problem that, that needs the regulation, those regulations? And then is it the appropriate, um, is, is, it, is it appropriate? So as Wayne says, uh, you're not guaranteed to get what you want, but you're guaranteed to not get what you don't want. So, so, um, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about Lima's, and, and especially this Sheridan Lima. It's the longest standing one that's out there. So, um, and, and different people have sort of looked at the data different ways. In, in the division, we've been 
sort of developing a tool that helps us look at um, as, as we take different actions, be the LEMAs or WCAs or whatever water conservation program that's going on, are they effective? And one of the challenges is um, irrigation demand, which is, which is by far the dominant demand out west, varies with, with climate, specifically with precipitation and evapotranspirations, basically, uh, you know, uh, irrigation demand. So, so we basically um, correlate use, historic use as reported in the division with these climate factors, develop a relationship uh, in the sort of pre-conservation uh, pre period, and then we see in the post-conservation period, in the, in the conservation period, are we changing our behaviors? So, um, so basically, because uh, some people were saying, well, this lima will only work because it got wet. And uh, uh, to make a long story short, and, and we've got papers on this if you want more detail, uh, it, it certainly was a, a little bit wetter, a little bit cooler during the, the, the lima period. That explains about 1.3 inches of the reduction. Uh, 4.25 inches of the reduction on average is actually from a change in behavior. There's been a very significant change in behavior here. They've adapted to, to new cropping and new ways of doing things, and, and, and it's working for them economically, and it's obviously saving the resource and also, uh, again, reducing groundwater declines. So based on the success of that, um, GMB4 initiated a district-wide LEMA. Uh, they basically looked at each of the townships. The, the squares are, are, are townships within GMB4 determined the average rate of decline in the recent record, and then basically came up with a set of allocations to, um, to, to address the problem. So where there's a greater rate of decline, the allocations provided in the Lima are lesser, more conservation required, uh, and where rates of declines are lower, less conservation is required. So we, uh, again, took this through the hearing processes, um, and I, I won't take you through all of this, but. Uh, this one, um, a group of interveners basically sought to, to come to the hearing and testify in opposition uh, to the Lima. Um, that, that, was, that was actually good. We had a lot better record, uh, but the Lima was ultimately adopted. And uh, this one, um, after the order of designation was issued, is, is in judicial review uh, in Go County District Court. Uh, on October 15th, they, the district court found that the district-wide Lima should be upheld. Uh, we're now sort of going through some, some additional processes. Um, to just, uh, I think this last week, the plaintiffs uh, filed uh, with Go County uh, asking the judge to sort of reconsider um, some of his decisions and extend them. Uh, so we'll see what the judge does. Uh, most likely this will, uh, no matter which side sort of wins, uh, will be uh, appealed up to the Court of Appeals, which is good. We really need to make sure that uh, uh, these tools are being used uh, as, as it should be. So. Um, so this is, um, so we've only had one year uh, of GMB4 being in Alima, so I don't want to make too much of this, but basically again we developed this relationship correlating uh, reported use with these climate factors, and then uh, we have one year then of in the conservation period where we did see quite a bit uh, less use than would, would have been projected by the same behavior under the same climate. Now again, that's one year, uh, there was some hail damage in, in some areas that could could account for part of that, but we actually looked at this not only district wide, but uh, by by counties are seeing this sort of strong relationship everywhere. So we we think we're we're starting to make some good. Uh, the the lemas provide for allocations, but they provide for them in a five year allocation, so that um, if it, it sort of motivates people to uh, sort of start up later if they can and, and shut off earlier if they can. And, and essentially extend that savings to maybe the next year when it might be hot and dry. And so as people sort of have that mentality going from a single year, how can I maximize the production this year, to how can I get the most of this water out of five years, it just starts to change the, the behaviors in, in some, some, I think, uh, uh, helpful ways for, for really, uh, really for everybody because these declining resources, the longer we can extend them, I think the better for everybody. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to say here, so um, after the Lima tool was developed, so all the Lima action has been in GMD4. As you see, we have some very significant declines in, in GMD1, Western Kansas, GMD1, 
and Southwest Kansas GMV number three. And, and GMV number three has a, a lot of our use, and, and as you see, a lot of the problems. They weren't interested uh, in using the Lima tool for various reasons I won't go into. But we had some water users in that part of the world that wanted um, some of the flexibilities that IGUCAS and LEMAs provide, because typically in these uh, corrective controls that are implemented, you not only have reductions in use, but you have some flexibilities to move water around and again, multi-year. So water users wanted to conserve because it was in their best interest. And so we went to the legislature and got a, a new tool uh, called water conservation areas. And, and these are quite a bit different from the other two tools. They're actually consent agreements between uh, the chief engineer and the individual water users, a group of water users, that again, typically facilitates water conservation areas. Uh, they have specific goals and requirements in terms of the, the, the amount of water they can use, but typically paired with some flexibilities to, to make better use of, or to maximize the economic benefit of that reduced use. Uh, no hearings uh, required because it's a consent agreement, a streamlined process. Uh, one of our management districts are provided opportunities to comment, but uh, that's the extent of it. So uh, these WCAs don't make a permanent change in the water right. Uh, they basically just provide uh, additional limitations and flexibilities, uh, typically over a five-year period, but some are longer. So um, th these have been a fair amount of work. Every one of them has to be evaluated separately because they're each in different contexts, different uh, amount of use. Uh, um, uh, typically, these flexibilities have to be evaluated to make sure they're not hurting neighboring water rights. But but we've, uh, over the years, sort of developed procedures and seen, uh, especially in this last year, significant expansion of this, of the use of this tool, um, particularly in, in a couple uh, critical areas. So uh, we sort of doubled um, the acreage and WCAs. It's, it's up to 86,000, which again is a very small part of the overall, um, I think something over 3 million acres in irrigation uh, in this area. but. Um, the, the big areas, and again, they're, they're small parts of the pie chart as you see, so the, the green and, and blue are the Limas, and so you see uh, most of it's in Wichita County, which is this area here. This is the most highly depleted area of GMD1. They, their average saturated thickness for the county is now under 20 feet, but they have some very important economic uses, a lot of animal agriculture, a lot of people that want to continue to irrigate, and so the, the, the water conservation area, they developed a, an overall water conservation area. Um, the, the, the first reduction for the first seven years you're signing up for, if you voluntarily join this, is 29%, uh, and it goes up to 38%, and it goes up to 50% over a, a, a couple decade period. And they're serious about their, their, their extending their resource. Um, about 20% of the counties enrolled and the Wichita County folks are pressing their GMD to, to essentially implement a LEMA uh, in this area as well to sort of let, let everybody be a part of the solution, not just those that conserve. So the other area is Finney County. Uh, we've got almost 20% of Finney County in uh, LEMAs as well, especially in sort of the area uh, sort of north and west of, of Garden City that's got some pretty significant depletion. So, so water users are starting to sort of take matters in their own hands. So, um, you know, we've been doing some other things to sort of support this. Uh, this um, uh, Water Office is a uh, sister agency. Uh, they've developed water technology farms, uh, basically uh, areas where they can demonstrate um, technology improvements and ways to, to continue profitability by, by using less water through, through various means. Um, one of the things I, I at the Wigan Water Conference, I listened to a, a talk uh, by a sociologist with K-State, and a group of them have been doing some some, some survey work, uh, just sort of look, list, uh, listening to people through a survey and through through interviews to determine, uh, you know, what's motivating them to be a part of water conservation, to do more of that, uh, what are they thinking about, and that sort of thing. And, and uh, not only in Kansas, but in, in the entire Ogallala. And one of the things they've been finding, or several things they've found, is that typically uh, producers, water users, through irrigators, believe they're doing all the conservation they can. They're doing everything they can to conserve water. That's, that's their attitude, and, and, and we hear this a lot. Uh, but then something happens to force them to, to a different behavior, and they adapt, and they find they can, they can still make money, 
uh, and be profitable with a lot less use. And so, um, so, and what's required to sort of move you from one to the other is somebody doing a, a lot of work to essentially um, develop that consensus that we need to manage our water differently. So, um, I've been uh, challenging, especially GMD3 I went to last week and uh, said, you're the local leadership that really needs to sort of put in the hundreds of hours to help water users make the shift for the good of the, the future economy. So again, next steps in the Ogallala. We're, have we resolved the problem? No, um, but again, we've got new tools. Uh, these tools, uh, we just, uh, uh, one path forward is to see an expansion of the use of these tools. Uh, again, as people, water moves very slowly, as people take this step individually, most of the benefit of that conservation is gonna stay with them. But as we get a larger and larger group of people to do that, um, the, the, the sort of the surety that uh, the result is, is more certain and, and really the aggregate benefit is more certain as well. So, so certainly WCAs are our path forward, but really we need more uh, LEMAs and, and more, more action uh, to uh, extend the economies of that region. All right, so that's, that's Ogallala. I want to shift now to South Central Kansas to um, the Guerrero National Wildlife Refuge. So uh, this is, um, and I should have had a picture of some, some birds here, but uh, this is the Rattlesnake Basin, uh, Rattlesnake Creek Basin. Um, so the, at the bottom of the basin, there's a national wildlife refuge called the Covira National Wildlife Refuge. It's operated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They have a surface water right. Um, it's very senior. It's senior to about 93% of the water rights in the basin. Um, so um, this this area, let's see here. okay, let me. So uh, this is rattlesnake here in this area. Uh, the, the soils are, are dominantly sandy soils, uh, relatively shallow groundwater. So as historically pre-development, uh, that, that precipitation recharge in the aquifer and then discharge into the streams as base flow. So Rattlesnake Creek historically has been a strongly dominant base flow stream. Um, with the development of all this irrigation, uh, then we've, we've had um, the, the groundwater users essentially intercepting the flows that are destined for the stream and seeing some pretty significant reductions in stream flows as a result. So we've, well, again, this has been apparent for a couple of decades. Uh, back in 1993, uh, well, the service has been complaining about this, saying their water rights been impaired. A, a partnership was formed to try and find some, some voluntary ways to address this. Back in 1993, they developed a plan that was approved in 2000. 12 years of trying to implement that plan. Essentially, not much happened. So um, with the inaction from the partnership, um, basically, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 2013 filed an impairment complaint asking, uh, asking the division to look into the matter and take action under the Appropriation Act. Uh, took, a, took three years to do the, the study uh, you know, using the groundwater model to determine and find definitively, yes, impairment that this upstream groundwater users are in fact uh, reducing uh, the, the usable supply to the refuge and impairing their use uh, significantly and regularly. So uh, this is a depiction of the models, uh, the, the models estimates of base flows uh, historically. Uh, the, the blue and green line, when they separate, the green line is basically the, the base flows that have occurred historically. You'll see a very strong uh, negative, um, uh, you know, st fairly strong imp impacts. The blue line is what would have been there if irrigation was not happening, if junior use was not happening. So, so a, a very significant reduction in um, base flows. Um, you know, the system is responsive to precipitation, so we do see some periods that are wetter where the base flows return, but again, we're on a very negative decline. So, um, so after that finding, we went to work, what's the remedy? And so the local groundwater management district, uh, number five, um, proposed an augmentation project. An augmentation is basically where you go and find a, a source of water external to the system, typically, and you basically pump it to replace your depletions that are uh, out of priority. And so, um, so this is a, this is a part of the solution, probably a dominant part of the solution. Um, and, and KDA, the Department of Agriculture, strongly supports it, and we've been doing that in a number of different ways. We, we do have concerns with the GMDs uh, um, wanting to have augmentation only as a solution. Uh, 
Uh, some of that's sourced in the augmentation project that they proposed. Uh, we certainly believe there's a dependable supply that's there, but it's a uh, we, it's a fairly sensitive area, and so the long-term yield from that augmentation project is unclear, and, and it'll have to be carefully monitored to ensure it doesn't create some upwelling. But this is a saltwater marsh because we sort of move from in the upper part of the basin from fresh water uh, in, the, in the lower part of the basin to uh, uh, salty water, and, and, and the, the historic flows have been a mixture of those two. And, and while the while the refuge can take a certain amount of, um, of saltiness, it, 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 uh, it can't take um, uh, too much um, uh, the fleeting of that fresh water supply. So the, the modeling also shows uh, we're heading to, to zero base flow, which is going to be problematic. And again, uh, again, if you want to hear more about this at another time, we can do that. But this is a depiction of the water quality um, in, in the stream as a function of uh, flow. And so the more flow, uh, the better the water quality, the less flow, uh, the poorer water quality. So we, we can't let the stream dry up completely because it'll create not only quantity problems, but quality problems as well. So, so we've advocated or required basically to remedy not only the augmentation projects that's developed, but a 15% reduction in flows to stabilize the streams. So that's been the challenge. Um, the, the GMD basically proposed the Lima tool as a mechanism to, to address the, the, the required declines to stabilize the stream, stream flow. Uh, their plan in the end that is submitted to the chief engineer included specific things they wanted to be done but did not include, uh, which was an augmentation project, uh, removal of end guns and other voluntary actions to reduce pumping, uh, and some focus reductions in the area closest to the stream. The problem was the Lima didn't prescribe corrective controls, i.e. what it was required. It didn't mandate um, those reductions, those actions. It, it just said, we're planning to do these reductions. Um, that's not really what the Lima law provides for, so, so it had to be rejected. So uh, that happened this last summer, and, and uh, there's been a bit of press on this. So uh, having an impairment uh, report uh, file, having somebody that's being impaired, uh, having no way forward to address the problem, uh, um, we made a determination that we needed to start to take action and, and issue orders to reduce pumping, uh, providing um, providing them three years to get their augmentation project on the ground because it hasn't got started yet, and, um, and, and kind of phasing in the reductions, and again, trying to provide as much flexibility as we could. Um, we actually proposed orders um, that would be We'd start in the area that was closest to the stream and then over three years uh, do the entire area that was interfering. An average reduction of 14%, uh, although the, the, the impact to individual water users uh, vary quite a bit. And then a, a, the water conservation area to sort of provide uh, flexibility to move allocations around and multi-year allocations. So we, set up, so we announced this. So I wasn't a very popular person as we, we put these out because the GMD was insisting augmentation only is the answer. We had a public meeting on October 21 scheduled. Um, just uh, the Friday, that was on a Monday, uh, October 21. Friday, close of business, after close of business, I get a press release from Senator Moran's office and he's been talking to a, a, an official, high up official in DC that is over the Fish and Wildlife Service in the Department of Interior announcing essentially that um, the service, the interior had agreed to provide another year to find a voluntary solution. So, so the orders are on hold and we're basically waiting for the service to engage us in the next chapter of this, um, this issue. So that is it. Uh, if you want to know more about any of these, we got lots of, lots of stuff on our website. More do you want to read? So time for a couple questions or not? Quick questions, maybe I can get back up. Yeah. How are they going to augment? Well, there's a, let me go back to that one map here. So, there, um, so again, the refuge is here. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Um, so there's an area down in here. So again, there's a, there's a highway called 281. So it's fresh water over here. 
it turns salty over here. So there's not a lot of irrigation development in this area, as you see. So they're, they're planning to put in 40 shallow wells, about 100 gallon a minute, 150 gallon a minute, uh, and basically take water off the surface, which is a, a better water quality, um, and, and pipe it basically to the to the refuge. So the concern is there's some some nasty stuff underneath that if they pump that too hard will create problems. So that's where the the challenge and the monitoring requirements are there. So, but that's the plan. You got a question? You want to? Yes. Yeah. Sure. This is going to be a very costly project. Does the GMD have the financial resources to move forward with such a a, a big project? I mean, right. you, you're ten, twenty million dollars. Yeah. So we've. Um, so, so the question is, uh, do they have the financial capability? Well, so uh, typically with implementation projects in the West, the biggest cost is buying the water rights. Uh, usually, that's two thirds of the cost of these projects, and then the plumbing is the other third. So uh, we're actually working with them. Again, this is an undeveloped area, so we're going to, the area is closed to new appropriations, but we're going to sort of allow them to essentially develop the area for this limited purpose. So they won't have to purchase the water right. It's still a five, 10, $20 million project. Uh, they, they'll have to find ways to finance it. I know uh, Nebraska, Colorado, we've, uh, we've been fighting them on the Republican River for decades, and they've implemented augmentation projects. And, through user fees, basically, um, is how they'll have to do it. So. All right, I'll be around if they got questions. Yeah, so. thanks. Thank you very much.